Good evening. I would encourage you, if you have a Bible with you, to be taking it out and be turning to the book of Ephesians, chapter 5, this evening. Because that's going to be the text that we're going to be looking at in just a few moments in Ephesians, chapter 5. As we study together this evening, I want to encourage you to take out your Bibles and attest the things that I have to say to see if it is by the Word of God. And hope that if you find it to be the truth, that we can take it and we can make application to our lives so we can be the kind of people the Lord wants us to be. <laughs> As we think about imitating, we often come back to that of children and how children often imitate their parents. You think about a young boy who his father, maybe his father likes some particular hobby, so he likes that hobby as well. He imitates him. Or maybe his father walks or dresses or does something in a specific way, so he imitates him. And as that child imitates their parents, I believe that's what we find the Apostle Paul appealing to in Ephesians chapter 5, when he said in Ephesians chapter 5 and in verse 1, Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children. We need to live and conduct ourselves in our life in such a way that we are imitating God. And I think it's finally important that we talk about being imitators of God and how we need to live if we're going to be an imitator of God. We find in Ephesians chapter 5 three things that the Apostle Paul says that you need to live and conduct yourself in if you're going to imitate God. So I want to consider those three things with you for just a few moments this evening. As we begin this evening talking about being imitators of God, the first thing the Apostle Paul says you need to do is you need to walk in love. In Ephesians chapter 5 and in verse 2 he said, And walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. We need to live and conduct ourselves in love if we're going to imitate God. And we need to do that because God is love. We find in the book of 1 John chapter 4, we find John reminding the Christians to whom he is writing that God is love. He says, anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. Later down in the same chapter in verse 16, he said, so we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. Whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. We need to imitate God, and so what we need to do is we need to walk in love because he is love. But he says in Ephesians chapter 5 that we need to walk in love as Christ loved. As we think about the example that Christ set of love, Christ set the supreme example of love for you and me. In fact, it's through his love that we know what love is. In the book of 1 John, 1 John chapter 3, and in verse 16, he said, By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our life, our lives for the brothers. It's through the example that he set with his love that we know what love is. And as we think about the love of Christ, we often think about how Christ loved the world. But what we need to do with the love of Christ is we need to make the love of Christ personal. We find the Apostle Paul who did that in the book of Galatians chapter 2. And in verse 20, in Galatians, the second chapter, and in verse 20, the Apostle Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. As the Apostle Paul did with the love of Christ, he realized that the love of Christ was something that was personal. Not only did he love the world, but it was a love that was for me. And to think about how great, how supreme the example of Christ's love is, His love should compel us. It should control us to please and to serve the Lord. The Apostle Paul in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, in chapter 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and in verse 14, he said, For the love of Christ controls us, or compels us, because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all who have died. And He died for all of those who live, might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. The love of Christ should compel us. It should control us or constrain our lives to please and to serve the Lord. But as we think about the love of Christ, we are told that we need to imitate that love. And if we're going to imitate that love, our love needs to have some characteristics. Well, what kind of love should we have? Four things very quickly. Well, first, our love should be a love that is genuine. In the book of 1 Peter, chapter 1 and verse 22, 1 Peter chapter 1 and in verse 22, the text says, Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth, for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. 
Our love needs to be a love that is genuine. It's authentic. It's real. Who could doubt the genuineness of the love of Christ? A love that was willing to leave heaven behind and come to this earth and to die for you and me. And if we're going to imitate Christ's love, our love needs to be a love that is genuine. Not only should our love be genuine and should it be an authentic love, our love should be a love that is active. In the book of 1 John chapter 3 and verse 18, John says, Little children, let us not love in word or in talk, but in deed and in truth. It's not simply just the words that I say. Uh, it is seen in the actions that is put forth. Christ didn't just simply say, I love you, though that is implied. But it is seen in the sacrifice that He made. He laid down His life for you and for me. It is a love that is active. Not only that, not only should our love be genuine and authentic, and should our love be a love that is active, our love should be a love that is sacrificial. It should be willing to sacrifice things for others. Maybe time. Maybe money or monetary means to help somebody. Or maybe even going as far as laying down our lives for the brethren. The book of 1 John chapter 3 and verse 16 we read a moment ago. He said, by this we know love. That he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our life for the brothers. If that time comes, yes, we should be willing to have a love that is sacrificial. That is willing to die for our brethren. But not only should our love be a love that is sacrificial, our love that should be a love that is constant. It's not a love that stops. It's not a love that stops because of things somebody else has done or the way somebody else has treated me. But it's a love that should never stop. And it's a familiar text for all of us in the book of Romans chapter 5. In Romans chapter 5 and in verse 6 through 8. Romans chapter 5, verse 6 through 8. The text there says, For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a, for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare, to, would dare even to die. But God chose His love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. In spite of us being sinners, in spite of the life that we had lived, Christ didn't stop loving us. He loved us anyway, and He laid down His life for you and me. And if I want to have a love that is imitating the love of Christ, and that is, and I want to imitate God, my love needs to be a love that is constant, it doesn't stop. If I want to imitate God, my love needs to be genuine. My love needs to be active. It needs to be sacrificial, and it needs to be a constant love. And I need to walk in love. I'm going to be an imitator of God. But not only do I need to walk in love, the text says I need to walk in life. In Ephesians chapter 5, and in verse 8. In Ephesians chapter 5 and in verse 8, we'll come back to verse 3 in just a moment. The text says, For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. We need to walk in the light. As we stated in the first point, we need to walk in the light because God is love. We need to walk in love because God is love. We need to walk in the light because God is light. They get in the book of 1 John chapter 1. In 1 John chapter 1 and in verse 5, the text says, This is the message that we have heard from Him, and proclaim to you, that God is light, and, and in Him is no darkness at all. God is light. But if you think about where we were, the text says that you were darkness. You were in sin. But now, you are light in the Lord. I want you to very, pay very close attention to what he says. Now you are light. The Apostle Paul didn't say now you are the light. Now you are in the light, but now you are the light. We are to shine as lights in this world. In the book of Matthew chapter 5 and in verse 16 and 17. In verse 16 rather. In the same way let your light shine before others so, they may see, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. You are the light. You are to let your light shine. In the book of Philippians chapter 2. In the book of Philippians chapter 2 and in verse 15. It says that you may have be blameless and innocent. Children of God that have blemish. In the midst of a crooked and a twisted generation. Among whom you shine as lights in the world. We are lights in this world. And so we need to live as one who is who is the light. And I want you to understand
understand that He says that you are the light in the Lord. We are only the light when we are in the Lord. When we are outside of the Lord, we are in darkness. But now that we know that we are in the light, you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. That means I need to live. I need to walk as children of light. Well, what does that mean? What does that include? If we're going to walk as one who is in the light. Well, it means first that I can no longer engage in the things of darkness and in the things of sin. If you come back to verse 3, the text begins there in verse 3 saying, But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness does not even be named among you as is proper among saints. Some of those things of darkness, he said, is sexual immorality or impurity or covetousness. Verse 4, he continues there saying, Let there be no filthiness or foolish talking or crude joking which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. I can no longer engage in the things of sin and the things of darkness. Because what communion has life of darkness in the book of 2 Corinthians? In the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and in verse 14. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and in verse 14. The text says there in verse 14, Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers, for what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness, or what fellowship has light with darkness? What fellowship can they have together? And he comes down in verse 17 and says, Therefore go out from the midst and be separate from them, says the Lord, and do not touch what is unclean, and then I will welcome you. He says the things of darkness can no longer be part of the life of the Christian. We must lay them aside. We must put them away. Well, why? Why should I not partake in the things of darkness? He names, he names five things here for us. He says, first, you don't need to partake in these things because they are not fitting for the saints. Look back in verse 3. In verse 3, he says, But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetous must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. Verse 4, Let there be no filthiness or foolish talking or good joking which are out of place. They're out of place in the life of a Christian. So I don't need to partake in those things. I don't need to partake in those things because those who partake in such things have no inheritance in the kingdom of uh, Christ and God. Look at verse 5. In verse 5 he said, For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or pure, or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. You have no inheritance in the kingdom of heaven. But only that. We don't need to partake in them because they bring the wrath of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, verse 6 says. For because of these things, things talked about back in verse 3 and verse 4, because of those things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. It brings the wrath of God. Not only that, they're unfruitful. They bring nothing good in verse 7. And rather, verse, verse 11. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. Have no, have no uh, part with those things that are unfruitful that produce nothing good. But only that, it's a shame even to speak of them. It's a shame even to talk about the things that they do. Verse 12 of the text says, For it is shameful to speak of the things they do in secret. We don't need to do to partake of those things. If they're, even, if they're ashamed to speak of them, much less I, should, uh, I shouldn't even partake in them. But not only that, if I'm going to walk into the light, or I'm going to walk as a child of the light, not only do I not, not, not only do I not need to engage in the works of darkness, but I need to begin by producing the fruit of the light. <coughs> he says, instead of taking in those things that are unfruitful, produce the things that are of the light. And all that is in goodness, righteousness, and truth. Look at verse 9. For the fruit of the light is found in all that is good, and that is right, and that is true. <coughs> and once I do that, not only do I need to engage in the, uh, produce the fruit of the light, but I need to then expose the things of darkness. If I'm going to imitate God, I need to walk in love, and I need to walk in light. But finally, the other thing the Apostle Paul said that you need to do is you need to walk in wisdom. In Ephesians chapter 5 and in verse 15, the text says, Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. You need to walk in wisdom. You need to walk carefully, making sure that the steps you make are in the very best way. The New King James Version says circumspectly. I like how Wu translates it. Wu translates it to be constantly taking heed how accurately you are conducting yourself. Make sure you're conducting yourself in the right way. 
And if I do that, I'm walking in wisdom. Not only that, if I'm walking in wisdom, it means I'm going to make the best use of my time. I'm going to take heed of the opportunities that I have, maybe to share the gospel with others, to teach others the gospel, maybe to study the word of God myself. The New King James Version says to redeem the time. In the book of James chapter 4 and verse 13 through 17, the reason I need to make the best use of my time is because I don't know how, time, how much time I have left. Again, in James chapter 4 and verse 13, saying, Come down to you who say, Today or tomorrow we'll go into such or such a city, such or such a town, and spend a year there, and trade and make profit. If you do not know what tomorrow will bring, what is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, Poor bills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance, all sorts of boasting is evil. So whoever knows to do the right thing to do it, the right thing to do, and fails to do it, forgive it is sin. I don't know how much time I have left. So I need to take heed of the opportunities that I have to do what needs to be done. Also in the book of Galatians, chapter 6 and verse 10, he says, So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, especially to those in the household of faith. If I'm walking in wisdom, it means I'm going to make the best use of my time. And I have an opportunity to share the gospel with others or to do something myself that I need to be that needs to be done. I need to make the best use of my time. But not only that, I need to understand what the will of the Lord is. What is the Lord's will for me? I need to understand what He wants. I need to read the Word of God and see what He expects of me. I need to understand what His will is. If I do that, I'm walking in wisdom. Not only that, I need to be filled with the Spirit. I need to be filled with the Word of God. In the text in Colossians chapter 3, Colossians chapter 3 and in verse 16. Colossians chapter 3 and in verse 16, the text says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. If you're going to, let the, if you're going to be filled with the Spirit, you're going to let the word of Christ dwell in you. I'm going to let the word of, uh, let the word of God dwell in you. But not only that, I need to get to this. I need to give thanks for the blessings I have. Give thanks to God. The text says in Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, he said, giving thanks always for all for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I need to give thanks. Not only do I need to give thanks, I need to submit to one another. We need to submit to one another in the fear of God. If you think about submission, Jesus laid down the principle of submission for you and me. The book of Matthew chapter 20. The book of Matthew chapter 20 and verse 27 and 28. He said, And whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Even if the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The Lord didn't come to be served, but he came to submit to the needs of others. Of Romans chapter 12 and verse 10. Romans chapter 12 and verse 10 it said, the text says, Love one another with brotherly love. Outdo one another in showing honor. Or well, the New King James Version says, giving preference to one another. We need to esteem others better than ourselves. Put them first. Do not think from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility. Count others more significant than yourselves. What I need to do, if I'm going to walk in wisdom, is I need to submit to the needs of others. I need to put them first. And if I do that, I'm walking in wisdom. If I'm walking in wisdom, it means I'm going to walk circumspectly. It means I'm going to make the best use of my time when I have the opportunity to share the gospel with others or to study the word of God myself. I'm going to take heed of that opportunity. I'm going to understand what the will of the Lord is. I'm going to be filled with the Spirit. I'm going to be filled with the word of God. I'm going to give thanks. I'm going to submit to one another in the fear of God. If I'm doing that, I'm walking in wisdom. And I'm being an imitator of God. If you're wanting to be an imitator of God, you need to begin by walking in love. You need to then walk in life. And you need to walk in wisdom. And if I'm doing that, I'm living a life that is imitating God. It may be that you're here this evening and you're not yet a child of God. <clears throat> Have you heard of the word? Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? Would you be willing to repent of your sins to the your faith? To be buried in the waters of baptism for the remission of your sins. Or maybe that you're here and you've already been in the gospel, but you've fallen away from the Lord and you need to come back. If you don't know how much time you have left, take heed of the opportunity that you have. For flawed obedience to a God. Be good at the same. Thank you.